This is my fifth trip to Brazil now, and I think uh, every time I go someplace like this, I usually end up asking people, would you want to go on a trip with me somewhere? Because I usually talk about these great expedi expeditions that I start. And so I was here with, um, I think, the campus party in Sao Paulo in January of 2011, and I was telling about all these adventures, and so I said, uh, who would be interested in going, and all these people wanted to go. So we said, okay, we're going to give you a challenge here, and we'll pick five people out of the, out of the group and bring them up there uh, to NASA, where I work, and uh, see if they can do something with our robots. And indeed, that's what started a big program here that now ended up in, uh, with a robot right here in Brazil that's sitting over there uh, behind you. Um, quite often, though, quite often I think that... Uh, how many people here have traveled a lot? How many people have, have, have been to North America? North, how about uh, Asia? Anybody? How, about, uh, how about Africa? Has anybody here been to Antarctica? Antarctica? Okay. Well, um, some of our robots have been to Antarctica. We take them down there to uh, simulate uh, Mars. And, um, and we try to develop... Uh, autonomy so the robots uh, can do things without people around, okay? And so uh, some of the things that are happening nowadays in our robotic, robotics are related to developing software to make them more autonomous. Anyway, I wanted to tell you about uh, uh, this program called a boot camp because it started a lot of things that uh, are now uh, developing right here. And uh, this was a program I started back when I worked at NASA. I, I worked at NASA 44 years and I just retired. So at this point I can't, uh, I can't represent NASA, so, but I, uh, I have been NASA Mike for 40 years, so it's a little hard not to talk as though uh, I'm still NASA, but I stay in the business as a in private business. I started a robotic business myself as a result of all this stuff I did for 40 years. Anyway, um, this boot camp program here. All right, let's see. Where do I point this thing here? Here. Okay, over there. All right. Okay, this boot camp was all about um, getting people like you involved in uh, engineering and robotics in particular. And uh, that's a field that is really developing, and it's something... want to be part of this uh, robotic world is happening and uh, if they have any special talents we give them an opportunity for a very difficult challenge and see if they can work together to accomplish it okay and so um, I've been doing this I started this as NASA but now I'm doing it through universities so let's see how it started okay um, what it does, what the uh, boot camp does is gives you an opportunity to uh, get your hands on you know um, you're not really marketable until you can do things. A lot of times you look for an employer that wants to give you a job that can train you. But when jobs are tight, they're looking for people who already can do stuff. And where do you get your hands-on experience? Well, this boot camp type thing can really give you that hands-on experience. It can give you something tangible to do to make that uh, theoretical stuff, uh, apply that theoretical stuff and see it in action. And uh, what we also do is we have a, uh, we have a fail and fix mentality when we do it so that you can be allowed to fail. Um, one of the problems with NASA nowadays is you're not allowed to fail. Everything's got to be very expensive because if you fail, the, the press will kill you. You just can't fail. And so it's hard to learn if you're, if you're not allowed to fail. So when, what I do is I try to set people up with a job that's challenging, but if they screw up and break it, as long as they don't hurt themselves, we'll fix it and keep going. And that, this really gives you the chance to, if you're afraid to try, now you'll try it. Now you'll try it. And also I get a lot of smart people together so that uh, you're helping each other and you have a critical mass. It's like you come in there thinking, well, I'm pretty good at one thing, but... You don't know anything about the other stuff, and these other people fill in for you. And you working together, you form a team, and uh, it's really amazing how working in teams you can get some things done that you wouldn't have thought possible uh, otherwise. 
Now, also, I've taken this to universities now that I've retired, and I'm trying to uh, get them started with a robot of some kind, and that draws in a crowd of people, and they sometimes can give you academic credit for working on a program for a short time, uh, like uh, uh, one week of intensive work, 12-hour days, and 20 people that are really, really interested in this working together with a couple mentors, and they can get something done in, in just, uh, just a week that might have taken a year, and what will happen is, uh, in the process, they're learning tremendously, and they actually get some academic credit to do it. It stimulates the university benefits because these people become uh, more excited about what they're doing and learn more how to apply the, uh, the things they learn in school. And then we bring industry in at the end and ask them to watch these people in action. And a lot of these people will become very marketable because uh, if you're in industry and you see these people, you can look at their grades and say, well, that's good, but what does it mean? But if you see somebody really building something and making your work, you know, that's the go-to guy that we need. You know, and that's, that's why the university needs to have a program where the people are actually doing relevant stuff, stuff that the industry can look at and say, yeah, we need that. And, and what we're doing is new. It's usually quite new, so they haven't had time for it to get into the books. The things you have to learn, you almost have to learn on the job. Okay? It takes too long for them to become textbook stuff. So this kind of program is necessary, and, and starting, we've started it, and you'll see it grow over the years. Okay, uh, I had a boot camp here at NASA, and there's quite a few people in it. They're from all over the place. I mean, uh, I would invite these guys and girls from, from anywhere, and we'd try to pick some of the best and give them these many projects to do. All right, this was the boot camp I had back in 2010. I had like 550 interns. Some people have an intern. I had 550 interns. Um, some of the projects we did, this is the project we started a few years ago, which is now uh, has led up to what we're doing in the back here. But I'm going to explain it to you as, uh, as we started it. The idea was that um, on Mars, we put robots there because it's too hard to get people there right now. So we've got the robots out there, and we have them working in groups. So now, as, uh, as the robots are on Mars, the people back on Earth talk to them through a satellite that's orbiting Mars. Okay, so as the satellite orbits Mars like this, then Mars turns around underneath it like that once every 24 hours. If the robot is here, it's under the satellite for only a few minutes, and then half a day later, it's under the satellite again. And so you can get a command in twice a day. So you'll send a command, and the satellite holds it until the robot listens and then sends the command, and then... 12 hours later, the robot will give you an answer. And so it takes 24 hours to have a cycle, to do one thing. If the robot is, is like it is now on Mars, we, we are looking at the, uh, at, at the robot directly whenever Mars is rotated towards the Earth. So we have a direct line for that. But once it leaves, we can't see it at all. All right, so right now, um, we can only command it for a little bit each day, all right? If, on the other hand, the robot is smart enough, autonomous enough, we can give it a command, it'll do something, and the next time the satellite is in view this way, we'll, we'll get the result. And so we can get the robot to do maybe 50 things before we see it again, if it's smart enough. All right, so that's what the mothership is all about. So this mothership here is our communication link to Earth, and she has to know where these other robots are and kind of manage them, like a field marshal, you know, like foreman on the job. All right, each of these robots would have special purposes. Some of them could be really big steam shovel, you know, that could dig holes in the ground. Some of them be little science labs, and whatever. But the mothership has got to be able to manage these, and so we send the commands, and she takes care to work on the field. All right. All right, now, this is uh, the autonomous mothership we started with, and we had a name called Nanook. Nanook means polar bear in uh, Inuit. And so the, 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 kid, the, the university up in Alaska named this robot because uh, polar bears are, is their mascot. All right. And uh, this is a picture of Nanook when, when it was in uh, Antarctica. We actually took Nanook to the bottom of the earth and to the top of the earth. It's quite a world traveler, actually. Um, okay. Now, this was that concept uh, that I mentioned about uh, when the robots are on Mars, and the, uh, the idea is we're using, um, well, the current robots on Mars have stereo vision, like me. Like they'd be putting a person on Mars and looking around and then telling you what they see. 
So when you get a picture back from this robot, it's something like a person would see. And then you can interpret it on the earth and figure out what to do. But to be autonomous, the robot needs to understand the data itself. And so we try to talk to our robot in uh, computer language, numbers rather than images, more like numbers. So uh, a photograph would have a picture like this, and uh, a laser image would have all these, everything out there would be dots. I'd, get a, I'd send out a beam of infrared light, it would bounce off a target and give me a distance to that dot, very accurate distance, a millimeter in 80 meters accurate. And then it would take another dot and another dot all around here, and then it would scan, and it would start to scan like this. So we, we were starting with Nanook that was taking a picture like this, and it would scan the whole area, okay? And then we'd take a picture over here and do it here like that. Okay, and so that's what we started with. And um, we get a picture like this. this. This picture, the colors tell you distances to, um, to, to the robot. All right, so we, we only assigned a few colors. But uh, in the robot, there's a thousand times more data than we're representing here. So we could send a picture like this back to Earth. Now, let me ask you, for example, if you saw this picture I took at the North Pole. This was, right, this was, literally, this was literally standing on sea ice, frozen sea ice at 90 North with nothing but ocean underneath us and uh, uh, 10 feet of three meters of ice. And uh, we had the robot there taking a picture of, of something. Can you tell what it was? What do you see when you look at this picture? Like, what does this thing look like? What does that look like? Is it a person, right? It is. So, see, now, if you had a 10,000 times more data, it'd obviously be a person. But you still know it's a person without all that data. So we're sending enough data home to, for the operator home to know basically what's happening and how to decide what to do next, OK? But if we had to send 10,000 times the data, it would take 10,000 times as long to send the data. You see what I mean? So it would take too long. And so we're, we're going we're to reduce the amount of data, and we're going to just give you enough to make the decision at home. But on the robot, the, the mothership can process all that extra data. All right, now what is this thing right here? Or what is this? How about this? What do you think that is? What is that? It's a uh, snowflakes, snowflake, right? Snowflakes. What does that mean? So, so you're on Earth, and you get this picture back from the North Pole, and you don't need a photograph to know that there's three people there, and it's snowing, right? Okay, you can say, well, I would like to investigate whatever's going on down here, see? And then you would tell the, the mothership, you'd send a command, say, okay, I want you to investigate this. So send the robot that uh, digs holes, let's say, over here, and have it dig a hole right there, or something like that. And so that's the kind of command you'd send the next time you get a chance. All right, so I send a picture back from Mars the same way. It's a, it's a reduced data, but it sends back faster. But it's enough data for the Earth person to figure out what to do. All right, now uh, the mothership can take that picture and rotate it into a, a top-down view, from a, from a uh, profile to a plan view from a, this view to a top-down view. All right, and then you get something like this. Um, all right, now this is the same data, but it rotated, and now it becomes a height map. So the colors tell you how high things are, and you can plot a path around the obstacles, you see? Now, if the mothership is doing all this in numbers, the mothership can plot the path. I don't have to plot the path. The way we are now, we would plot the path, and we'd tell the, mother, the robot on Mars, go forward, okay, stop, tomorrow, turn, go this way, stop. This way, the mothership can do it on her own. So what she does is she says, okay, I want a path uh, to go from here all around, all these things. I got to avoid the green things, let's say. So I'll go here like this and like that, you know, that kind of thing. So the mothership can plot that path herself. Okay, that was the idea. All right. All right, so now... Um, the mothership, may, the way we had it scanning first, it was scanning uh, this much field of view here and it going up like that. So we, we wouldn't see anything there unless we rotated and then we did it here and we rotate like that. We'd have to rotate like four times to get everything. And, uh, but that was how we started. And then uh, we got the Brazilians involved here. And so I want to jump to that. Oh, okay. First off, I want to say um, if you ask the mothership to have that robot 
go to that place. It has to plot a path from the robot to there. But how does the mothership know where the robot is? Well, any five-year-old on Mars could spot you instead of her, right? It would say, where is he? Oh, that's him right there. And he turns sideways, it's still him. A five-year-old could figure that out. But we haven't got a five-year-old on Mars when we need one, so we've got to teach a stupid robot to distinguish the girl from the guy. You know, how else are you going to do it? So we got, how are you going to do that? Well, so what we decided to do here was we put these uh, spherical balls, targets, on the robots. Each robot would have two targets on it. Let's see. Okay, there you go. For example, each robot has a, a ball on there, and it may be the certain size ball. Like this ball is uh, 20 centimeters, and this one is 20 centimeters, and they're separated by 40 centimeters, whatever. And that defines you. But her, she's defined by a different arrangement of these fiducials, okay? And now, when you have the robot mothership take a picture of it, um, take a picture, where is it? There, oh, there, okay, there. Now, you see the balls look like a circle. You see how they look like a circle? And the nice thing about a sphere is it looks like a circle from any angle. Any way you look at it, it always looks like a circle. So now, you have your software developers develop a circle detector, right, in the data. Your job, should you choose to accept it, is to look at this data and figure out how to find all the circles, okay? So, if you have a circles with a bunch of people like that, where's the robot, is the question. Where's the robot? Okay, well, the circles, what, as soon as you scan, the, um, oop, as soon as you scan, you get a bunch of circles. Some of those people's heads look like circles in a certain direction, you know. Some of them don't, but in other cases they do. So you have to distinguish the, the circles you want from the ones you don't want. So you have this a set of uh, heuristic tests that we run. Heuristic test, that's a funny word, but that's a set of tests. It's that I only want the circles that are 20 centimeters, and then the two that are 40 centimeters apart would tell me where she is. See that thing, okay? <laughs> that's her. That'd be her. So if you were standing here with the two circles like this, and he was there with this guy, then we'd spot you out, right? And not only would we know it's you, but we know where you are because we know the distance to every dot, and we know the orientation because... One circle is closer than the other. See, like this. So it must be, must be pointed that way, right? So you'd know the, the, identify the robot, the location, and the orientation, all from the digital data. So that, that way a computer can figure it out. So now I give the command, says find her, send her over there. Then he has to find her first, and then plot the path, and then send commands. Go forward, turn, go forward, turn, go forward, turn. That kind of thing, see? So then it does it all autonomously instead of waiting for me next week. Okay. And it can plot. Here's how what it looks like. It's found the robot. It sees all the people here, see? But it found the robot. And it also tells you where the robot's pointing. See that? So if you went back here a second. There, all the people. Remember this? All the people. And now, now you find it right here. There it is. <laughs> so the mothership can do that on her own, right? Okay, cool. That's pretty cool. All right. So now, uh, now what? Let's see. <laughs> okay, you plot the path, okay? <laughs> okay, so he does all the path planning and he does it. And then the next time the satellite comes overhead, the robot, the robot is over there where it's, and she's ready to dig a hole or something. What is she going to do? She's ready for it. All right. Oh, let's see. Okay, now, um, now the, robot, the worker bots also carry a LiDAR scanning device like this. It sends out the beam of light, and it receives the signal back, and it's, it is aimed down here like that at 15 degrees, and it's moving like this. Boom, hits, it sees that, and that signal says it's closer than this. And it's so close I have to avoid it, see? And then it comes over here, and it's, it's over, and it doesn't come back fast enough. It says, that's a hole. Don't go there either. So you use the laser as a cane, okay, to avoid obstacles and, and holes. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool, huh? So once again, the, the, the worker bot is able to not fall in a trench and get stuck. Okay, so then that's good. But if the, if the, if the mothership says, um, okay, I want you to turn, uh, let's say I want you to turn from here, I want you to turn all the way over to here, and it's slipping, 
it only gets to here, and then it starts to go off the cliff. So that's when it has to take action on its own. So the, the worker bot would avoid that, and then they say, oh, well, I'm confused now, I'm lost, because uh, what, are you, what are you sending me over a cliff for? And so he says, sends back to the mothership and says, I'm lost, I deviated from the plan. So then she takes another picture and says, oh, you're going to fall off the cliff. Back up, and then turn over here, see? And so she has to do all that while I'm at home waiting to, for tomorrow. See? So she's taking care of all that stuff on her own. And that's what's so cool about it. All right, so now, okay, that's a, there is an example of a, a worker bot. Okay. And now, now what happened was I was presenting this um, and, uh, in one of these events here in um, Sao Paulo, I think, at the campus party there. And so a number of um, Brazilians wanted to get involved, right? So we created this project, and we ended up sending some up there. And what they did was, uh, these three people are, I don't think any of these guys are here today, but uh, they, were, they came up in 2010, and they were working with the, uh, a 360-degree laser. Now, before, I only had one that did this, and since then, I got one that did this, and we put it on a platform like that, and it generated a sphere of all this data, see, all that data in a sphere. And so instead of um, losing, a, if our mothership was tracking the worker bot and it left the field of view, she'd have to look for it. But now he's always in the field of view, so that made it easier. So their job was to create data from this thing that we could use. All right, so they did that. And, um, and then we got involved with Bruno, who's back there somewhere. And... Um, uh, his university picked up the job for the next year, and we ended up uh, building the robot like this and sending it down here. When I retired, I made one myself and sent it to them. And now they've got, they've got one, and what they did, the Brazilians built this platform for it, and it, it actually does the mechanical job of scanning the, uh, the laser like that, okay? So they did electromechanical work. They also did some electronics for it. And then uh, other people started doing the programming on the data. So they were involved for the engineering for mechanical, electrical, and software development. And the most currently, they're doing now mostly software development using the data to actually uh, stitch images together and to uh, plot paths and to uh, find objects in a 360-degree three, image. Where is it? Where am I pointing this thing, anyway? Uh, if you have a shadow, you'd have to move the robot to look behind the shadow still. But you still get a 360-degree picture. All right. Now, we've had a lot of other robots that we worked with over the years. And uh, some of the other things we've done in the past, we're building parts for these other robots. Like in this case, we have some mechanical arms, and uh, this is a wrist joint, <laughs> which uh, has a roll, pitch, and roll. And uh, <coughs> the Brazilians that came up there also, I mentioned this because they designed this, this equipment. And from their CAD drawings, their computer-aided design drawings, we were able to manufacture these things for them. So they actually were able to build something from their design. Um, and this is uh, Hamilton Pinheiro, and uh, he was, uh, I guess he's from uh, Rio de Janeiro, I think, and uh, he designed these particular uh, grippers, okay, and then we had them made for him. All right. And then uh, we built this robotic arm with two arms, and I'm thinking of sending one of these arms that I still have uh, down here for you guys to use. And then this was uh, Gabriel, and he uh, designed a quadrocopter. Carries a little camera, and it flies around here. And he, uh, you've seen those around. He's, he wanted to design that one. And then um, this is our Brazilian team from last summer. Oh, uh, we have our own T-shirt even here. <laughs> All right. Okay. And we also had some team like this from Mexico. I'll just point that out because we had quite a good team there too. And some of these guys have continued working with me. Uh, even though I retired, they, we've done things together. This was our boot camp from last summer. Um, we had 55 people there again. And we did all these different projects, robots and little robots and big things like this. And I want to just show you for a minute here some of these other projects we did. This one, uh, this one was a Greenland robot. It's a, it's a solar wind-powered device, weighs about 800 pounds. 
And the idea was to carry uh, this ground penetrating radar across the two mile deep ice in central Greenland and unattended to actually measure the depth of the ice uh, for months at a time. And uh, the, the idea was with a ground penetrating radar, you can get a signal back every time there is a change in the ice that reflects a seasonal change from winter to summer. And uh, that, that means you can calculate the ice accumulation for every year going back hundreds of years. It, but you've got to do it over a large area. So if somebody was doing it on a snowmobile, they'd have to stop for, for lunch and gas very often. But if a robot can just run do it for months at a time, then they can map out an area the size of, uh, uh, I guess, Pernambuco uh, State. And they can do that in three months. All right. So... Uh, the idea was for us to build that for them. And um, that was a science mission. And we had some people up in Alaska start the job a few years ago, and they came up with this idea of big, big uh, inflatable tires that would make it very light and have dance across the top of the ice. And then uh, we brought that down from Alaska, and we started with it, but we, we decided that it would bounce too much, and we wanted something with heavier traction they wouldn't be blown sideways. We, got, we made our own tracks instead. And we have all these students working on this. And we ended up with a pretty heavy device here. It actually, uh, actually looked pretty good now. And we have it, whoops. Now right here, can we start this? Let's see if you can start this video here. Right here, yeah, there you go. Up a little bit, up. Yeah, right, right about here. There it is. This is, uh, this is the Atlantic Ocean. You know where that is, right? Where is it? Right outside, right outside the wall here, right? Well, this is in Virginia, right in, in uh, North America, the same ocean but up there. And this beach is right near where I live. So we brought the robots down there to simulate the snow uh, surface. Here's this two-mile deep ice. The ground is way down there. On the surface, it looks like the sandy beach. So we would use the sandy beach to, dem to, to simulate the surface. And uh, you can see this thing had a lot of torsion, uh, torque. You could really pull a big guy on the back and not even slow down. And so it, it's capable of driving across Greenland pretty well. And uh, we talked to it through a satellite link. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, uh, now we also had something. Some people wanted to put some obstacle avoidance on it. This fellow was from, uh, from Ireland, and he's, he wanted to... He wanted to get the obstacle avoidance because he wanted to use it for his own, own work back at his university at Trinity College in Dublin. And so he, he designed that. He was happy to say that. All right. And so, okay, another one. The next trip was we made one that was even from, from the first year. Okay, wait a minute. Let's try it again. Okay. Now switch to the next one. There, okay. Now we made one that's smaller, and we made it uh, with more efficient solar panels so it could be smaller, and that reduced the size of everything. And then we put the batteries down inside the tracks. So they used heavier weight to hold it down. We made a lot of improvements like that from the first one. And so now it was a lot lighter, but it was still very low center of gravity, and it still had the same power. And uh, we, we, this is more transportable. So this one is actually being, was being tested last summer on the beach. All right, go ahead and hit this one. All right, so it's, it's, it's what it looks like when it's on the move, okay? And it actually is now in uh, Idaho, where it had a lot of snow this year, and we're using it with the University of Idaho in Boise to uh, prepare it for the mission to Greenland. It's going to Greenland in uh, next year. And the thing is, they're testing it with the science instrument on board in a snow-covered place in uh, Idaho at, at that university. So, so that university picked up on it after I uh, retired. Okay? All right, now, that's just speed. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, so we had lots of these, these things going on all the time. We've done our own welding. We've done our own design work and welding and manufacturing. And so that, that was the kind of thing we did for a number of years there at NASA, and I wanted to try to bring it to Brazil. And so that's what I actually did. And so now we got these folks. How many people are in this picture here now? 
Yeah, they are. Yeah, see, there they are. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so they helped me. We started this same idea down here. Why not do it right here at the university in Brazil? So we did, and uh, all these people are uh, very interested in this. So we made a robot for them, and then they, we used their platform, okay? And we brought it down here, and one of our, one of our uh, mentors, Gabe, right here, is showing them where we start with this thing, and then they picked it up on it for 10 days, about 12 hours a day, and they had to finish building it, because I, when I built it, I didn't finish it completely. I, I left it up to them to finish the mechanical, electromechanical part, and they did that. And then uh, they also worked on the software development. So we had some me mechatronics guys here finish the robot, and then the software developers in the back were into that. <laughs> That's me in the news. We're in the news. And then they start generating these images in 3D. And there are 360 degree images like that. So that's kind of what a picture looks like when you chop the top and bottom off and you have it like that. Okay, so see, see they, they had to take the idea I had with just the, uh, the two dimensions and turn it into a, uh, a 360 degree panoramic view. All right, and that's unfolded. That's what it looked like in their lab. Okay, so now they brought that robot down here and we want to pick up on it and take it to another level. While, while they're working, people from industry can come in and watch them work and say, that's the kind of go-to guy I really need. That guy and that girl there, they're the ones that have really got what it takes, the right stuff. We want to hire them. So some people could get a job right out of this because they, they're doing some hands-on work that's very relevant to industry. All right, and then this is the, uh, the final presentations. And they're, they were demonstrating the robot down here and what it can do with and the software imaging and all. All right. And then uh, when I, one other thing that I'm doing now that I retired, I, have a, I try to make a company to do this myself. And uh, it's not profit, really. It's mainly, mainly about bringing this idea out to your place like this, to these universities, try to get you involved, get people involved. And uh, what I am trying to do is I've tried to uh, find things that people can do. They're mostly software development. Um, and I have a project here I want to just show you. This one here, uh, this is an arm that um, some of the people who um, I know from the military that uh, have a bomb disposal robot will send little robots like the one I have over there out to, um, to explore this bomb, uh, bomb, and they'll be back far away like this operating it by line of sight, and they'll have lots of levers and things that they have to operate it with. And the problem is that... Um, they move each joint independently, like that, you know, and it's very much like a robot dance, like, like that, you know, it's working their controls like this. And what they wanted me to try to do with our, with our um, uh, graduates is to make it smoother operation that anybody could do more intuitively. So what he's doing now, this guy had never seen it before, and he's looking just at the end effector, and he's just moving the end effector, and a computer inside the arm there now is telling all the other joints how to move to catch up with what he wants to do with the finger. So as he moves the gripper a little bit, we have to move all these other joints here, 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 and the computer is telling him how to move, you see? So, so what happens is uh, uh, he only has to look at the end, and, uh, with one, and he has one control instead of many. And so um, the idea was that we could make that kind of an improvement to an existing arm. And, uh, and we're doing those things to... Uh, to get people involved and, and real world challenges. Something that already exists, you've got to make it a little bit better. Okay, but you can do it in a short time and you can do it uh, with a team of people. It isn't going to take a fortune to do it. It's something you can do relatively inexpensively and maybe a lot of it has to do with software so you don't need a machine shop, okay? And so these are the kind of projects we're looking at doing and bringing to you and trying to get you involved. And hopefully uh, it does several things. It's very exciting, but you learn a lot and you learn a lot of marketable skills, and industry finds out about you and can offer you some jobs. And uh, I think the universities like these kind of programs, but they've got to be um, jobs you can do to get results in a short time. You can do it with the kind of people you have, and you can do something meaningful, you know? It's got to be really... And so that's what, these, that's what we're kind of doing. We're dreaming up stuff for you to do and get you out there to get involved, okay? And so that, that's what I'm doing as a uh, side job now that... Uh, uh, I'm uh, filthy rich and don't need to work anymore. <laughs> okay, now, then let me have any questions. Any questions? Let's see. I should, I should put these headphones on here.
Okay. Just need to put it on. All right, put it right in my head there. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good, yeah. Okay, any questions? <laughs> I got my headset on. É, bom dia. É, eu queria saber como que é feito a manutenção do, dos robôs quando eles resolvem, quando acontece algum tipo de problema com eles. E se é mais, se vale mais a pena financeiramente falando, o mandar uma outra máquina ou consertar uma que já aconteceu algum problema com ela. Well, that, that's a is the question whether or not to repair or uh, or to send a new one. Each case is different, I think, right? Um, most of the time we design into it some kind of um, we design into some kind of uh, uh, redundancy. Okay, because we anticipate failures, we plan for success, but uh, design for failures. And so the way to design for it is to have workarounds in the software and also uh, in some redundant hardware. And so we, if we get to the point where we can uh, command it to the backup, the backup mode, okay, then we would do that by command. If it turns out it's dead in the water, we probably, uh, in Greenland, we'd go get it and we'd fix it, okay? But in the Mars, we just sent another one, okay? So, I mean, it all depends on how difficult is it to get there, okay? It makes sense. But, but the design, one of the things you have to design for, especially in this, is uh, a certain amount of redundancy and uh, fail-safe alternatives, okay? That, that's a whole science in itself. Um, we had things like um, just the obstacle avoidance, so it didn't get into trouble. But we also have, we know that uh, there's going to be bad days and good days for the sunlight. So we have wind power as well. And that's the kind of a redundant so, uh, power input. Because with the, uh, with the sun only, there'll be a cloudy day and it won't be very strong, right? It's like a failure. But the wind usually is better. And then we have a plan where if we don't have enough power, it'll stop. And, and if it's not moving, it doesn't take a lot of power. It'll, it'll be able to hibernate until the batteries charge up. We monitor that, and then we say, okay, you're ready again. And also, um, uh, we have uh, tracking the sun, and we have a program there for tracking the sun. And so uh, if, we, if it fails, we are less efficient, but it would still work, that kind of thing. So, so we, have, um, we have designs that we allow for problems, and we have a whole bunch of problems we can fix, and a whole bunch we can't fix, okay? So then, uh, in the case of recovering it in Mars, we were probably out of luck. You know, the, the rover over there had a lot of redundancy, uh, did a lot better than expected years instead of days, and yet uh, eventually it dies, so eventually you just have to send another one, like the one that's landing here later this week. Don't forget to watch for that, uh, okay? It's going to be landing this week. Curiosity. Okay, another question. É, eu também gostaria de saber, em média, quanto mais ou menos custa um, um robô desses que é enviado para o espaço? Se tem uma média, assim. Well, well, for space, it's very expensive. Uh, in the hundreds of millions of US dollars. Okay? Now, the problem there, the launch alone, just the launch vehicle is 100 million dollars. Just a vehicle to get it off the ground. Uh, so uh, 300 million dollars is a good number and it's just a little thing but it's so complicated to try to have all those backups and it's very expensive so my little robots you know they're like a dollar 98 in comparison to that I, I think that might have cost uh, maybe uh, thirty thousand dollars or maybe more if I depend on my hours but if I do it for free the parts maybe thirty thousand and if your labor is free we don't have to count that but you know we're not going to fly that to Mars, okay? <laughs> this is, that's just uh, Recife. <laughs> okay. Boa tarde. É, eu gostaria de saber qual é a sua expectativa sobre a nave, a Curiosity que está chegando agora em nove dias lá em Marte. Você está acompanhando, você está ansioso para a chegada dela? Yeah, right, August 6th. That's the day I return home. 
I was going to give a talk uh, uh, there. I have to get home in time to give a talk. But the thing is, um, yeah, the um, many missions to Mars never get to Mars. They fail. Uh, most, in, almost all of them fail landing on Mars. They just crash and burn. And and the U.S. has been pretty successful, even though we have had failures too. So, if it lands and uh, doesn't destroy itself, then the expectation is great because it's a very, uh, very uh, advanced scientific set of laboratories, okay, for studying, looking at uh, soil and uh, air and looking for signs of previous life and whatever. Very, very involved and the expectation is that uh, it just works. I don't think you're going to find any life on Mars. I think there's almost zero chance. But you have to dig and, and, and run around and find out about it and you'll find out what is there. What is there and what evidence of the history is there. So I think that the expectations are great, that it, but the, uh, you got to get it to land first. What, what the uh, previous rovers have done was marvelous, I mean, because it is so difficult to have that do all those things out there on another planet, you know, without any kind of catastrophic failure. It's amazing. But, uh, and how much does it cost? $300 million is pretty cheap for that kind of thing, considering the amount of people involved and the amount of people have to get paid a good salary just to be involved, and the amount of paperwork we have to do to make that happen. So um, I would like to say one thing, too. When I was your age, uh, we were uh, just launching satellites, and um, everybody wanted to uh, go to the moon, you know, beat the Russians to the moon and all. And so I started working at NASA uh, before we landed on the moon. And so actually, I actually built stuff in my house that has landed on the moon. It's got my name on it. So I'm, I'm like the man on the moon. But, but the thing is, we all thought by now we'd be living on Mars. Why are we not living on Mars right now? And the problem is, it's still just as hard to get off the ground as it ever was. You know, we didn't even have computers when we landed on the moon. All we had was a guy on the spaceship would say, he'd look out the window and, and get a little sextant and make a star reading and see some angles. And, and so he'd call the data back and somebody with slide rules and a room size calculator would figure out, okay, here's what you do. You rotate, uh, fire this thruster to rotate and then stop. Okay, now you're here. Okay, now when we tell you, Flip this switch for three seconds and you'll start to change the uh, mid-course correction here. <laughs> Off we'd go for three seconds. And we had to go to the moon doing this, you know. And it wasn't all computer control. It was scary. And it was like, these people are going to die. And so how many times can you do it? But we, we decided that it was so, bad, so risky that we'd wait. And the problem is it's never gotten any easier, even with all the computers. In your lifetime, what you need as a breakthrough is a cheaper way to get off the ground. If you see that happen, and then all the stuff you see around here is already way advanced beyond then, and suddenly everybody will jump on it. It'll be marvelous advances suddenly. So hopefully, in your lifetime, your career lifetime, we'll be able to get off the ground faster, better, cheaper than I could do it. And then, uh, then you can apply all this computer technology. So just point that out. Yes. OK, next question. Hi, here. What that? OK. Queria saber assim, com relação à transmissão de informação, né? Enfrentar assim, o maior problema enfrentado por vocês até agora com relação à transmissão, o recebimento, o envio e recebimento de informação um, em outros, em outros okay. planetas, em outros planetas, né? Em Marte, por exemplo. <laughs> ok, ok. You know, right now, I actually worked on this spacecraft that's called Voyager. Voyager, it was launched in the 70s, mid 70s. Uh, and uh, it has gone out past Pluto. It's gone out to the solar boundary where the, uh, the uh, solar pause is, where the effect of the sun is, is zero now, and it's like inter-solar, inter uh, it's out of our solar system's effect, and it's inter interstellar um, uh, zone there where there are, there's uh, influence from other stars now on it as opposed to just our Earth, our sun. And... Um, How's data coming back from there, right? We're getting data right now from this thing that's already, like uh, it's almost 40 years old, man. And uh, how are we getting the data back? Well, it's very slow rate, and it's in a very unusual frequency band. So right now, I'm listening to all this noise, right? And if somebody out there speaks English, and I can hear them, 
I can zoom in and I can find them and lip sync on them and say, oh, I see it. Right now you're talking English. Because I can sort it out among all the noise because it's, it's something I'm very familiar with and it's different. Well, we send the signals back in a very different kind of way that, and we can find them that way. And we also do convolution and coding and, and things of that sort, but that makes it different. That's the kind of stuff that makes it very unique and we can isolate it. And so lowering the data rate down has helped and also we have these giant antennas on the earth that are big ears that help get a, a lot more signal from that weak signal and that can get enough signal to bring it up above the background noise. So we, we have to reduce the background noise by having a unique signal and having very little other stuff in that band. We, we just don't listen to anything except that one band of frequencies and that reduces the noise floor. And then we, uh, we try to make our signal very unique which raises the signal level and then we amplify it by having a really big ear Okay, and so we do all that stuff and we get data back from, from, from 5 billion miles away. 5 billion miles, it's, it's stupefying, but it's happening now. Okay, now uh, on Mars, it's only uh, 8 minutes away. It's only, speed, it's a speed of transmissions there. It takes about 8 minutes or less because sometimes Mars is even closer. The sun is about 8 minutes away. That's 93 million miles. If Mars is on the other side of the sun, it would take twice as long, but if it's on this side of the sun, it's very few, very only, only a couple of minutes away. So we can have a lot higher data rates. We also have antennas on board uh, the spacecraft. Or what we're trying to do is um, we'll eventually build a communication system orbiting Mars, like the one I'm talking about here. And that will have antennas that are pointed right at the Earth. And it'll be focused on the Earth. Okay, high gain antennas. The, these, the uh, Voyager has that already. It has a an high an gain antenna that... It's, it uh, maximizes the signal in one direction, and we do that, and we'll uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to get a lot higher speed communications than we've ever had in that in uh, Voyager. But but it's uh, still much slower than what you're used to. It won't be anything like internet speeds here, but it's fast enough to get the data back. And then uh, we also use tricks with the data to try to compress it, so you get more information with less less uh, data. And so um, all that technology has helped to, um, to give us a, a really uh, quite a bit of data actually. And Mars is so close, uh, data limitations are not the primary concern anymore. You know, we, can't, we can't do certain things, but what we can do is quite adequate at this point. The bigger problems would be things like getting there safely and backup plans. What happens if something fails? What are you going to do if it fails? And how are you going to get around it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Over here. Uh, primeiro lugar, é, parabéns pela apresentação e eu queria saber um pouco mais sobre você comentou sobre o assunto de manutenção. É, quais são os, quais são os, os estudos de confiabilidade que vocês costumam fazer quando vocês lançam um empreendimento desse porte? Se vocês também têm espaço para estudos de confiabilidade para o pessoal que trabalha nos bootcamps e se vocês é, que tipo de tecnologia vocês acham que é, vocês podem desenvolver para ajudar as outras, as outros ramos do conhecimento aqui na Terra, por exemplo. O que, que seria interessante do, do conhecimento espacial para trazer aqui para a Terra? Obrigado. Uh, well, that's interesting. Lot, lot there. Okay, what uh, what type of uh, precautions do we take to understand and uh, and handle the uh, unknowns? Uh, there there are a lot of known problems out there, like the day-night cycle and the temperature changes and such. And we usually create these, uh, we have these thermal vac chambers that simulate the environment of outer space, okay? That's one thing we do. For example, we have to simulate um, all the known conditions we're going to go through. The first one is all the vibrations from the launch, like that, vibrate the heck out of it. And all that noise, that uh, acoustical noise. So we, si we simulate that and we put our, our spacecraft in this environment and if anything breaks, we, f we figure out why and then we try to fix it so it won't break, okay? So we test it on the Earth. And we also put it in a thermal vacuum cycling. So it looks like uh, the kind of environment it'll see in space. Now, um, on Mars, there's an atmosphere, so you deal with that too. But, but in, we have chambers that can adjust uh, the thermal vacuum conditions to simulate Mars. And then the day-night cycling where you have an expansion and contraction is one of the big killers of the electronics. And that, that, what, that, what you do there is you, um, you try to shake out the obvious problems and pick, 
fix them so they, they are isolated, they won't expand and contract so much. And so you, you try to create the problem and then fix it so it won't happen later. All right, now there are also a set of unknown unknowns. We don't find out about them until you get up there. Then you find out there are Martians that are going to step on it. <laughs> Things like that. You find out there's problems that you didn't anticipate. And the only thing you can do is you have redundant systems and you have uh, software workarounds. Usually the software is pretty reliable. Now there are also problems like uh, radiation degradation. And uh, you can do some shielding and that can help. You can do some uh, other uh, creative um, um, uh, I guess uh, decoding techniques so that you can anticipate problems and realize that uh, that this is a bit error that was generated by uh, some uh, radiation and ignore it. You have to have to run those tests in real time while you're sending data. Like you'll have uh, two or three things collecting memory and you'll compare them all the time. And if one of them's out of line, you ignore it because that data got distorted probably. So you're 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 doing things of that sort to uh, to try to um, Find out when you've been hit by something like a radiation that could have flipped your data from a one to a zero and would cause a lot of problems. So, so uh, the unknown unknowns you handle by those types of techniques where you are redundant and where you uh, try to uh, have a workaround plan. Okay, so you can turn. We had a, uh, a case where um, <clears throat> one of our satellites uh, thermal expansion after the third orbit caused a, uh, a screw in the chassis to touch the uh, printed circuit board and short out the, the whole bus for the power bus. And then by the time the satellite came around the next time, it was dead. And they said, what happened? Where did you go? And it had shorted out. And they, um, they couldn't figure out what it was until they looked at all the old data and they saw something that was happening. They said, well, it must have been this screw finally hit it. And they figured it out, but there was nothing they could do about it because everything was dead. And and I think two years after it had died, uh, I was going to Antarctica, and I had, a, um, I had an antenna system there that was going to talk to some other satellites, and, they, and we were talking about this one that had the problem, and it was the same type of uh, communication system. So uh, they said, well, it, it really, uh, we don't know if it's even alive now, but if, if the thermal expansions have continued to remove the short, It'd be still be alive, but it's tumbling out of control, and there's never enough solar power on it to get the power system up and running. And so we can't get a command in anyway. So I said, well, I know if it's flying over Antarctica, the light reflecting off the ice in Antarctica can lit, light up the solar rays no matter how they're pointing. Imagine this big glow of light looks like a torch, and, against, and if the satellite comes over very low, it lighted up on all sides, no matter where the solar ray is pointing. And I said, if it turned out that the thermal expansions have relieved that short, then we can get a command in. And they said, that would cost millions of dollars to try that out. Sounds good, but it would take years to study it. And I said, no, 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 I'm going down next week. Uh, just give me some commands. Give me authorization to try it uh, and uh, send, uh, send me a letter asking me to do it, and uh, I'll give it a try. And so you know what? They did that, and I tried it, and it worked. It turned on, the satellite had been dead for two years. <laughs> and I, I was going to talk about that, that kind of story, uh, some of my adventures, if we talk on another lecture later this week. But uh, I had to tell you that much now. Yes, next question. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Pessoal, eu queria só chamar o Bruno Fernandes. Bruno? Dá uma chegadinha aí. Bruno é coordenador tá, do Bootcamp aqui na UPE. Alô, alô. É, Bruno é coordenador do projeto Bootcamp na UPE. E eu trouxe ele que ele também tem um desafio para fazer para a Mike. Ele disse que ia perguntar uma coisa para ele aqui. Uh, hi, Mike. We are wondering if you have ever made a handstanding. What is it? Have you ever made handstanding in a campus party? Yeah, handstanding. Handstanding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I've done here now? I don't have any pictures. I can do it if I had to. Uh, he can hold it. Huh? He can hold the you thing. Sorry. Oh, God. No, your choice, okay? If you don't want to. I do lousy handstands. <laughs> okay, here. I try it. I don't know, man. If I'm not good at it. I'm getting too old for this. It's always my excuse. <laughs> don't you want to take the... Ah, o Mike, ele viaja pelo mundo plantando bananeira, né? 
Aí ele nunca fez na Campus Party, eu acho que vai fazer agora. Só mais um detalhe, ele é faixa preta em Karate e quinto dan, né? Alô, alô? I want to congratulate Bruno for his team. Where is his team there? Raise your hands, guys. This guy, these guys worked on this robot, and they've got it in the back. You ought to go check it out. They've done some really good software work, and now they're challenging some other people from around the area to, as part of this campus party to, uh, to do even better. And then we're going to send it back to the university, and it's going to keep getting better each year. Hopefully, next time we come to campus party, it's going to be really fancy. All right? I'd like to see you all contributing any way you can, learning and getting better jobs because of this. Thank you. Quem tiver interessado lá, quiser aparecer para... Quem quiser aparecer para conhecer o robô, entender um pouco melhor do projeto, a gente está situado ali no acampamento de robótica aqui da Campus Party, ele está fazendo alguns experimentos, desenvolvendo o robô ainda. Então, quem tiver curioso pode chegar lá e perguntar ou a mim ou a alguns alunos que eles vão responder. É, lembrando também o concurso de robótica livre que está aberto, né? É, para quem quiser trazer o seu robô para apresentar aqui na Campus Party, é um, é um concurso do cenário Galileu. Tá? É, de, o, a regra está no site da Campus e tá, também está lá no www.robolivre.org. É só escrever seus projetos de robô e levar. Não esqueçam de devolver o tradutor, né? o pessoal pediu para lembrar disso. Às duas horas a gente volta no cenário Galileu e nos outros cenários também. Muito obrigado aí para todo mundo. Valeu, Bruno. E aí, gostou do Red Stand? Eu achei que era onda.